Um, thank you very much for starting the recording, Bjorn. Um, so welcome again to another edition of the Microstructure Exchange. I'm Cameron Pfeiffer from the University of Oregon. Um, and today we are delighted to have Jay Khan with us from the Office of Financial Research, which is at the Department of Treasury. Um, I don't know whether to introduce you as OFR or Treasury. Hey, oh, it's a good question. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll leave it at both then. Um, so just for uh, kind of the, the rules of this seminar, Jay is open to being interrupted. So if you have a, a question or something, you can just kind of interject. Um, and um, Daniel Barth is here in the chat. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and uh, Daniel will try to answer them as well. So if you have like kind of like clarification questions, maybe you can help with that. Um, but otherwise I'll be monitoring the chat. So we'll, you know, we'll keep an open dialogue with Jay as we go along. So um, please join me in welcoming Jay Khan and uh, Jay, the floor is yours. Thanks, Cameron, and thanks to all the other organizers. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about our paper, Hedge Funds and the Treasury Cash Futures Disconnect. Uh, this is joint work with Danny Barth, who's gonna be in the chat. Uh, and uh, I'm at the Office of Financial Research. Danny is at the Board of Governors. So this has to come with the usual disclaimer that these opinions are ours and not those of our respective employers. So the background of this paper is in the extraordinary stress that treasury markets experienced during March of 2020, when we saw, if you look at the figure on the left, option implied volatilities, if anything, higher than they were during the 2007 financial crisis. And the figure on the right, we can see that there was massive illiquidity in the most liquid market in the world by looking at the bid-ask spreads of across different maturities of treasuries. So during the peak of this illiquidity, we find that hedge funds sold over $200 billion worth of hedge funds. And leading up to this illiquidity episode, we find that there was a major shift in treasury markets as hedge funds treasury exposures increased by almost a trillion dollars. And if we look at the figure here in the center, we can see that the flows that hedge funds were doing here were of similar size to more traditional holders of treasuries like banks and pension funds. So what we're gonna do in this paper is ask three questions. First of all, sort of what explains this large rise in hedge fund treasury exposure? Second, why did hedge funds sell so many treasuries during March? And finally, what are the consequences of having hedge funds be such major players in the treasury market? So um, what we do in this paper is uh, by linking uh, a series of public aggregates and regulatory microdata together, we're gonna show you that around 70% of that $1 trillion increase in treasury exposure uh, is associated with a disconnect between cash and futures prices of treasuries. And in particular, in recent years, treasury futures have been overvalued relative to a replicating portfolio of cash securities. That disconnect in prices made an arbitrage strategy known as the treasury cash futures basis trade profitable, which relies on long positions in cash treasuries, short positions in treasury futures, and substantial repo borrowing. And both because of the large size of this trade amongst hedge funds and because of the links that it forms between these three crucial markets, we think it's very important to understanding the structure of the treasury market in recent years, as well as to understanding hedge funds activity. So in order to sort of tie that into broader issues of treasury market structure in the full paper, we're probably not gonna have time for it today, but in the full paper, we write down a model which shows that how through this trade, hedge funds act as sort of warehouses for treasuries, taking them off of the balance sheets of traditional holders and allowing for risk sharing between those traditional holders of treasuries and the asset managers who represent the majority of long futures positions. So the other side of this trade. Now, crucially, hedge funds can't be perfect warehouses in this trade uh, because they face two risks that prevent it from being pure arbitrage. In particular, uh, the trade is exposed to margin risk on the short futures position, as well as rollover risk on the repo borrowing. And what happened in March is that both of those risks materialized. And we find that roughly $100 billion of hedge fund sales occurred associated with the basis trade. So roughly half of the total sales amongst hedge funds. And what we're going to do uh, near the end of the presentation is talk a little bit about the consequences of that for broader treasury market functioning. So to start with what we think were the main, was the main driver of this uh, arbitrage activity, we're gonna talk about the relationship between cash and futures prices and the 
frictionless market. So, you know, if you think about it, these two things sort of have to be related. I can either buy a treasury today or I can enter into a futures contract today that will deliver me the treasury in three months. You know, the difference, only difference between those two things is that I have to wait three months for the futures contract to pay off. And I can, you know, you can account for that difference in time by looking at a three month bill price, for instance. Now, this arbitrage relationship is going to rely on the fact that as that delivery date approaches, the treasury futures price and the cash price should be the same. And what we're showing you in the figure on the top right is the convergence of the cash and futures prices as the delivery date approaches. What the arbitrage relationship on the left is enforcing is that that convergence should occur at the rate of the bill yield, essentially. Now, crucially, while there are a variety of treasuries that can be uh, used to deliver into this futures contract, uh, it turns out that there's only one treasury for each contract that's actually going to be desirable to hold for the arbitrager, uh, which is known as the cheapest to deliver treasury. And this figure in the top right is showing you that convergence for the cheapest to deliver. If we look at another treasury that's deliverable here, you can see there's actually divergence because it's not the cheapest to deliver, so it's not desirable for an arbitrager to hold. Um, so this is going to form a crucial link between the futures market and this one specific cheapest to deliver treasury, which we're going to exploit in a few different ways in the rest of our discussion. So what we do in the paper is establish an empirical counterpart to this arbitrage relationship using cash prices from CRISP, futures prices from Bloomberg, and a whole host of rules about how these futures contracts are invoiced and settled. And what we show is that this relationship doesn't hold in recent years. Uh, in particular, you know, we're not the first people to show that there is, can be deviations from this arbitrage relationship, but we are the first to show the recent uh, increase in the divergence between cash and futures prices. And in particular, if you look between 2018 and 2020, as well as between 2015 and 2017, we can see that this blue line here is above zero. And what that indicates is that the futures contract is actually overvalued relative to the cash security. Now, we do some statistics here to show that this disconnect is substantial and time varying, but it's also predictable both in terms of its average value and the volatility of the relationship over time, which you know all suggests that there are some limits to arbitrage going on here that we're going to describe more in detail. Now, in particular, you know, an arbitrage relationship like this isn't just you know, enforced by magic. Someone has to go out and actually trade these securities to make it hold. And in practice, the way this is done is through the cash futures basis trade. So how does this work? If the futures contract is overvalued, I want to go you know, long the undervalued asset, short the overvalued asset. So I go long the cash treasury security purchasing it today, and I enter into a short futures contract to deliver that treasury at a future date. Now, I have to make a cash outflow today, which requires that I you know, fund it. The way I do this is by borrowing in the repo market against that cheapest to deliver security as collateral. Now, if you want to think about this relative to the relationship on in the frictionless market, instead of enforcing convergence on the at the bill yield, this is enforcing convergence at something like the expected repo rate to delivery. Now, crucially, the repo borrowing that we see for this trade appears to be largely overnight. And so this is going to drive one of those uh, limits to arbitrage that you know, we were talking about earlier. Uh, in particular, because I'm borrowing overnight, I'm going to have to roll this financing over many, many times before the futures actually delivers. And so I'm exposed to the risk that repo rates suddenly rise. At the same time, um, you know, if you're running this trade, you have a short futures position. There's a margin requirement on that, which can lead to sudden cash needs to meet that margin requirement. Now, those two risks are going to be compounded by the fact that in principle, the amount of leverage I can take in this trade is only limited by the haircut on treasury collateral, which is around 2%, meaning that in principle, a basis trader could be levered up to 50 to 1. Um, now, this sort of just presents some of the risks. It also gives us some idea of what the balance sheet of someone who is arbitraging in this market should look like. They should have a large, long cash treasury position, a matched short futures position, and substantial repo borrowing against the cheapest to deliver in order to fund that position. And what we're going to show you in the next section of this is that by looking at different regulatory data sets on hedge funds, we can actually 
assemble a picture of their trading behavior that looks very similar to that stereotypical balance sheet. So in particular, we're gonna rely on two data sets here. The first is gonna be Form PF, which is a Dodd-Frank mandated collection of data from hedge funds, uh, where they essentially report a lot of details about their balance sheet on a monthly or quarterly basis, including their gross and net assets, their gross and net returns, and importantly for us, their asset class exposures and their types of borrowing in amounts. Um, now, crucially, those asset class exposures in Form PF are going to mix both treasury cash and treasury futures positions. And so we're gonna to have to do a little work to, to disentangle those two, which I will show you, in fact, on the next slide. So you know, what this slide is arguing is essentially that if we look at the aggregate positions of these hedge funds, they bear a lot of similarity to that picture of a basis trader, right? So if we look at the figure on the left, the dark blue line is showing rising long cash exposures around 2018. And the size of that rise is about half a trillion dollars. Uh, at the same time, the light blue line shows rising uh, short uh, treasury exposure. But again, these mix cash and futures exposures. By looking at data from the commitment of traders, which is a public aggregate series that we use here, we can see that you know the majority of this these long exposures, the vast majority are actually cash because the futures, long futures position is much lower. At the same time, almost all of these short, short exposure is actually futures because the blue and the red line almost exactly overlap. So that suggests that they are indeed going long the undervalued asset and short the, um, and short the overvalued asset. And to look at the third leg of this trade, which is the repo borrowing, we can look at the net repo borrowing across hedge funds. You can see here a similar rise of about half a trillion dollars in recent years. And moreover, we can see that net repo borrowing by hedge funds is highly correlated with the disconnect between uh, cash and futures prices of treasuries, which suggests that there's a more general pattern here. Now, um, all of this is just speaking about all hedge funds, right? So one thing that we do here is we classify certain uh, hedge funds as large basis traders um, based on their similarity to that stereotypical balance sheet of a basis trader. And what we find is that about $714 billion of gross treasury exposures, which is about 60% of the total amongst hedge funds is uh, associated with these large basis traders. They make up almost all of the net repo borrowing and in addition, if you want to think about the size in terms of you know, other markets that they're involved in, um, a $500 billion uh, basis trade would imply that about 30% of primary dealers repo lending during this period is going to this basis trade uh, by itself. Now, in order to speak a little bit to the risks that this could involve, uh, we look at the leverage of these guys and we find that the median leverage of basis traders is around 17.6, and the average leverage is about 21 to one. So, um, you know, I don't necessarily love comparisons to uh, LTCM, but if you want to think about it, LTCM had a roughly $50 billion uh, of gross assets and are about a leverage of 25 to one. I did some back of the envelope math last night. And the least you could believe about the maximum leverage amongst basis traders, given what we reported, is that there is, uh, is that the maximum leverage across basis traders is 25 to one, so about the same size as LTCM. But in order to believe that, you would also have to believe that there are quite a few funds of both a similar leverage and a similar asset size as LTCM. Um, and your alternative to that is to believe given what we've reported, that there are some funds with substantially higher leverage and, and gross asset exposures than LTCM in this market. Uh, we have a question, yeah. it looks like, from Bjorn. So Bjorn, go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks, Jay. Very interesting evidence here. Uh, maybe I missed it, but why is the arbitrage spread so high in 2016? In 2016, yeah, that's a good question, and it's something we're working on. We're going to um, show some of the drivers of this spread in a few slides, as well as we're going to focus more on this 2018 period because our you know main focus is on demonstrating this link. Uh, 
Um, but when I get there, I'll, I'll list some possibilities for exactly why these um, arbitrage spreads may have grown. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a very yeah. Good it's interesting because there, it, uh, there's no corresponding uh, bump in the um, in the in the arbitrage yeah. activity. So so we I, I'd like to. So there's a little bit of a caution here. Like we're not trying to argue that all treasury exposure is due to these basis traders. So it's possible that during this period, there would, if we're looking specifically at basis traders, we might see a similar sized bump in the long and short treasury exposures. The advantage of looking at their repo borrowing is really that there are only a few trades that say large relative value hedge funds would be running that would involve net repo borrowing since most of the time they're say, arbitraging against two different treasuries, which involves matched repo borrowing and lending. And in fact, here, I'm gonna just look at that, look at this real quick. In fact, if we look at the you know, gross repo lending and borrowing over time, prior to the, or outside of these two periods, they're pretty much matched, which suggests that they're doing a lot of trades that are exactly trading one treasury off another, against another. And so it's possible that during this period, there were a substantial amount of those trades going on at the same time that are sort of confounding the aggregate picture. But that's something that that we're doing more work on now. Thanks. Okay, no it looks like there's another question from David yeah. as well, if you want to answer. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so uh, wouldn't uh, the long stuff Fleckenstein paper tell us that at least what happens 2015 is Basel regulation and so to what extent what you're showing us is the true arbitrage spread? And there's sort of two components here that are missing, I mean, three. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, at least to the optionality, uh, there's kind of regulatory yes. constraints. Um, and the third will be, um, so I don't know how you include the repo because I just saw the bills. So repo spread and the fourth list mm -hmm. is uh, sort of expectation of future repo rates. Yeah. Uh, right? We'll yeah. go into that into that spread at least. I don't know how you're taking that into consideration. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So in terms of optionality, you know, one thing that we've looked at is you know, a lot of the optionality in this contract, there are two versions, right? One is based on when you deliver. The other is based on what you deliver. In terms of what you deliver, um, it turns out that over this period, the cheapest to deliver is actually extremely stable. Right, so there's actually much less optionality than they, there used to be. So that can't really explain the rise in spread, but we haven't done an exact decomposition of that yet. Um, in terms of when you deliver, we're taking the standpoint of delivery on the first uh, delivery date. That seems to match what basis traders actually do in practice. Um, but you know, it doesn't account for exactly the, the date that this actually would occur at. Um, now, in terms of the repo spread, so we've been kind of hesitant to directly calculate the repo spread for a variety of reasons. One is that, you know, if you look at the, we're going to show you some data from the repo market on hedge fund borrowing a little bit. But in general, right, when we look at repo rates that we have available to us with a long time series, they're inner dealer rates, right? So they don't represent the borrowing costs of the hedge funds. And so we've kind of punted on this by using the bills, but we will show you some of the uh, more direct repo data from actual hedge fund borrowing that we can have. We just don't have a long time series of it. Uh, we are, however, going to show you that this does, this spread, since it includes a bill rate instead of a repo rate, does correlate very well with the spread between say repo and IOER, uh, which suggests that the repo rate is doing some of the work here. Um, and I think I may have missed one thing that you mentioned, regulatory costs. We think those are definitely important. And, you know, Fleckenstein and Longstaff did a, a very good job in demonstrating that. What we're going to be more interested in than the specific regulatory costs of holding this is about how the trade developed between multiple different counterparties. And we'll show you that in a, a little bit. So it's not about the rental cost of, say, one particular financial intermediary. It's about a transfer of assets from dealers to asset managers through hedge funds. And that's what we're going to be focused on. That's that, absolutely. I think that yeah. it was mostly to refer as, as a reference to Bjorn's question about what happened in 2015, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What no, and, there, and, and there I agree. Problem. That's that's going to be one of the big theories that we have for what could be driving this is precisely that for whatever reason, the marginal cost of holding treasuries increased cash treasuries. 
leading to this going. So that would be completely consistent with what they said. So just quickly jumping on that. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like for you to, if you can, comment on exactly that, because I, I, I you've been pretty clear on the channel you have in focus here. Um, can you say something about um, effectively these hedge funds intermediating um, uh, trades that were, yeah. the, the, the selling of treasury is going on and the buyers are in the futures and if yeah. we remove them for whatever friction and we just talked about a few something's happening to this market can you talk to the total cost of some trades that don't get completed anymore uh, and mm -hmm. how large is that cost uh, to all to the to, to essentially the, uh, the all participants or you know, call it welfare or what have you. But I think you, you just said that's that a good going question. On, right? Yeah. The so the model that we have set up that um, unfortunately I'm still not probably going to be able to show you uh, is is very simplistic. It's not easy to get a, a welfare cost out of it, uh, especially since sort of it mixes. It doesn't distinguish well between balance sheet costs and risk sharing, right? Which are two important things to distinguish between when you're doing welfare analysis. Um, I think it's an interesting way to go in the future. I'm going to probably disappoint you on that question, on the welfare question today. I can show you guys really quick um, exactly what but I meant. Just hold, it, just hold yeah. it for the, for the back of your yeah. presentation. I, I think uh, you, you'll have a bit of sympathy when you try your hand and everybody understands it can't be perfect, but it's, yeah. it's going to be such an important question to not to compl no. stay completely silent on it. It might be a mistake, but uh, okay, I'll <laughs> yeah, let you go. I, I agree. It's important. I, I think it's something we would like to get to, and we have. So I, I definitely agree. Um, and just in terms of the one thing that I was going to show here to sort of place this in broader context, you know, we can see these hedge fund short futures contracts rising right in lockstep with asset manager long futures. So that suggests where, where sort of the treasury risk is going to, right? Um, and we know it's gonna be coming from traditional holders of uh, cash treasuries. And we'll show you a little bit more on that in a second. But before I do that, so, you know, all of this is speaking, you know, unfortunately form PF doesn't report anything on, on a, a QCIP level, right? We get general classes of exposures by a hedge fund by hedge fund basis, but we can't see anything about what they're holding specifically. So to look at that, we're going to turn to look at um, evidence from hedge funds repo borrowing, right? So we know that, uh, if hedge funds are basis trading, they're going to be borrowing substantially against the cheapest to deliver as collateral. And that's what we're going to be building towards here. So there are sort of two venues that hedge funds borrow from in the repo market. It's almost all un or bilateral uh, repo borrowing, right? There's almost no tri-party repo, which is kind of the repo market where to the extent that anyone's used to dealing with repo markets, tri-party is what they're used to. And this is sort of like a little bit odder. Um, so, um, unfortunately, the larger amount of borrowing occurs through unclear bilateral repo. You know, this has in and of itself some financial stability concerns because, you know, it's not cleared. Um, but the rest of that borrowing uh, occurs through uh, cleared bilateral repo and specifically the Fixed Income Clearings Corporation's uh, DVP repo service um, and the sponsored borrowing segment of that repo service uh, in particular. Um, now, I just mentioned something about uh, repo costs here. So this is where it becomes important that we're actually going to be able to look directly at some hedge fund trades, uh, specifically because the repo markets in general are fairly segmented. So between sponsored borrowers like hedge funds and DVP and sponsored lenders like money market funds, there's about a 10 basis point spread may not sound like a lot, but this is all overnight borrowing and lending against treasury collateral. So it, it's larger than it might otherwise seem. Now, in comparison, if we look at, say, a tri-party repo contract, we're seeing about the same rate that we see in DVP sponsored lending, which makes sense because tri-party is mostly money market funds lending to dealers. And if we look at, uh, say, rates reported by in broker tech or GovPX, what we're seeing is interdealer rates, right? So they're lower than these hedge fund rates. And the thing we're going to show you is that these spreads actually widen during times of crisis. So it's important to get like the most specific repo data to hedge funds we can. But another thing that we can use this sort of unique collection of transaction level data to do is to look at what hedge funds are borrowing against, 
So in particular, in this graph, what we've done is uh, classify um, all of the um, traders in the DVP repo market, and we've taken out the hedge fund. So we're only looking at hedge fund borrowing. And what this is showing is a kernel density plot because of disclosure reasons of um, treasury uh, borrowing against collaterals by maturity date. So these gray windows are the deliverable treasuries for the two-year and the five-year contract. And we can see that there's substantially more borrowing within those deliverable windows than outside of them. Moreover, that green dot it denotes the borrowing against the cheapest to deliver for the two-year contract as collateral. It's the largest position we saw of any positions uh, during this period. And this is the two-year treasury for the December contract. Right after that December, first December delivery date, we see that borrowing decline pretty substantially. Now, in terms of magnitudes, that borrowing is about 4.5 billion, which is something like 10% of total outstanding. And this is surprisingly large given the fact that DVP is likely to only represent a small fraction of total hedge fund borrowing. And so this is again suggestive of the fact that not only are we seeing these large positions that match the you know, stereotypical balance sheet of a basis trader, but we're also seeing security level evidence that their um, trading patterns align with what they should be if they were basis trading. So all of that, you know, suggests the, the, the size and importance of the basis trade amongst hedge funds. Now, you know, I'm going to turn to a like, brief description and overview of what we do in the model to try and place it in the broader context of treasury market structure. Um, so in particular, you know, the model we have in the paper shows how the basis trade results from segmentation between intermediaries. Um, this sort of takes place in a fairly standard limits to arbitrage uh, framework, but we're using it to get more of an idea of how the three sort of different um, types of agents tied together in this market. In particular, you know, hedge funds are taking these treasuries off of the balance sheet of traditional holders of treasuries, funding them in the repo market, and then holding them to deliver to the futures market ultimately. And through this hedge funds are acting as sort of warehouses for treasuries, but they're not perfect warehouses within the model because of the risks that they face in particular because of the margin constraint on the futures contract, as well as the um, potential that uh, their repo rates rise um, suddenly. And so both of those things can trigger sudden sales by these hedge funds that then have a broader impact in terms of treasury market functioning. And you know, as Albert said, this is where it would be very nice to have more of a welfare calculation. It's it's not there yet, but I think it would be, I think he's completely right that it is a good direction to take this. Um, now, you know, there was a question earlier about exactly why the basis increased. And, and here's where we get back to you know, the discussion we had before. So the, the first possibility for that the model sort of suggests for why the basis might increase and hedge fund volumes might rise is that the marginal costs of holding treasuries rose for other participants in the economy. So we can think of two reasons for that. The first is just that regulations maybe became tighter on say dealers or pension funds. Um, Moreover, right, the amount of outstanding treasuries increased pretty dramatically in 2018 following the Tax Cuts and Job Act. And so that may have meant that, again, the marginal cost of holding those treasuries rose simply because the volumes were much larger. And we'll show you something about dealer balance sheets that's consistent with that in a second. You know, a second reason is that demand for futures contracts may actually have risen by asset managers. And again, there are sort of two reasons you can think of for this. One is simply that short rate volatility during this period was increasing as the Fed got farther and farther away from the lower bound, right? There's just not much volatility when we're stuck at zero. Um, another possibility is that this is simply represents desire for off balance sheet duration exposure, which uh, if, you know, say pension funds have much higher return um, things to do with their cash might be desirable for them uh, to do. And a final explanation, and this has been circulated by um, others, sorry. Apparently my uh, cell phone has decided to go off. All right, so the, the, the final explanation here is that it's possible that the cost of basis trades to hedge funds actually fell. Now I'm a little suspicious of this because 
normally if you're thinking that hedge funds are doing more of this activity and the basis is actually widening, we're not thinking of the cost to the hedge funds actually lowering. We'd expect sort of the opposite, right? Um, however, I, I think it's worth mentioning that the two sort of theories here. One is that there's a decreased cost of repo borrowing for hedge funds. Oftentimes people mention sort of sponsorship in DVP may have had something to do with this. I'm very suspicious of that simply because DVP borrowing is small relative to total hedge fund borrowing um, and even relative to the size of the basis trade. Um, a second possibility is that changes in dealers risk management practices may have um, led to this. So in particular, um, Josh Younger at uh, JP Morgan likes to talk about the uh, use it or lose it rules on leverage um, by uh, banks. Again, I'm a little suspicious of that for roughly the same reason that it's not really consistent with the basis widening at the same time that hedge funds are you know, doing more of this activity. But, you know, we can't, there's, we're not going to present evidence that's going to eliminate that possibility. Um, so in terms of the empirical evidence we can show, and this again uh, relates to David's earlier questions, um, we can show that, you know, first of all, GC, the spreads in repo rates do seem to matter for this trade, uh, as do dealer exposures. This is very much in line with Fleckenstein and Longstaff. Uh, we can also show that maintenance margins and volatility generally matters. Uh, it's a little harder to look at treasury volatility specifically because all of the um, <laughs> All of the volatility indexes for treasuries are option implied volatility indexes. And by another arbitrage argument, they should be related to the futures price. And so that if you don't believe that, that arbitra one arbitrage is going to hold, you can't use the other one. Anyway, but broadly, what this suggests is consistent with the stories of limits to arbitrage, as well as with um, dealer balance sheet constraints being an important driver here. Um, so finally, one thing that we can do is look at the effect that this trade may have had on the underlying cash treasuries by looking specifically at the cheapest to deliver treasuries. And what we're showing you here is that actually the cheapest to deliver uh, earns a liquidity premium that is very highly correlated with the liquidity premium on say on the run versus off the run um, treasuries. And in fact, that correlation increased at the same time that we saw hedge funds uh, treasury holdings increased pretty dramatically, which suggests that this trade might be delivering some additional liquidity to the underlying cash securities. And so this is another side on that welfare question. It, something like this calc, um, statistic would be necessary to fully assess that. Um, so you know the model um, also suggests though the exposures that hedge funds have can spill over into broader treasury market functioning. And so to look at that problem, we're gonna to turn to examine uh, March of 2020 and the events so surrounding this uh, from the point of view of hedge funds specifically. So if we look at sort of the onset of March um, illiquidity, you know, we can see that dealer exposures were actually very high going into March of 2020. Um, and this is something that has been pointed out in the past by like Daryl Duffy, for instance. Um, so, um, what happened during March of 2020 is that there were large sales from real money investors like foreign official accounts and mutual funds uh, that seemed to have uh, that were associated with the onset of the pandemic and seemed to have led to it being hard for dealers to make markets. Um, and as a result, we saw a rising volatility, which was had an impact on treasury uh, cash futures basis traders. So, um, in particular there's gonna be a direct and indirect effect on those basis traders. So first of all, if we look at the figure on the left, we're seeing sort of the direct effect. So treasury volatility rose, and at the same time, futures volatility was going to rise as, as well. And what we can see in this chart, it's showing you the uh, price movements in terms of contract value uh, against the 90th uh, percentiles of price changes in the previous two years and the size of the treasury's uh, futures margin. And what we can see is that um, in late February, um, there were price, the, as volatility increased pretty dramatically, there were price movements that were well outside of the margins um, 
set by the CME. Um, now, um, it is not clear from this picture alone, of course, whether or not these actually led to margin calls. There's some evidence that they may not have. Uh, but even without a direct margin call being uh, coming through, uh, it would still be the case that these rising volatilities would require a prudent pullback by hedge funds in the anticipation of future uh, margin increases. Um, so that's that sort of shows the direct effect in terms of increasing margins. The other risk that hedge funds were exposed to was through the, the repo market. And what we can see is that um, this red line in this figure shows the repo rate charged to sponsored borrowers. So that's essentially hedge funds um, in DVP. And we can see that we can see the effect of the uh, decreases in the Fed funds rate target um, here and here. But we can also see that um, going into um, the second week of March, um, DVP repo rates for hedge funds actually rose above what that rate would suggest. So if we were looking, we'll show you a spread in a second that'll make this clearer. But this suggests that there were some uh, problems with repo market liquidity during this period. Now, at the same time that that's occurring, uh, what we're showing you here is the two-year uh, futures implied yield and the two-month treasury yield. The difference between those two is what we're reporting as our cash futures disconnect measure. And what you can see is that right when these repo rates increase and during this period of much higher margins, the relationship between um, the futures implied yield and the two month treasury yield breaks down. And we start to see a big expansion in that disconnect that continues into uh, until April. Now, um, during the same period, um, we saw hedge funds exiting the basis trade to the tune of about $100 billion. And we get that number consistently across different measures or different estimates of exactly how much selling they would have been doing, which suggests that they I mean, there are two possibilities, but the one that we sort of, the consistent narrative that we are trying to tell is that essentially their ability to enforce this arbitrage relationship broke down because of these two frictions realizing. Now, all of this says that um, hedge funds may have gotten into trouble because of the risk they face in this trade, but doesn't really speak to the effect that this had on broader treasury market functioning. And so to do that, we're again going to look at the price of the cheapest to deliver security, since that's the one that's closest linked to this trade. Uh, so what we're showing you in this slide is going to be that same deliverability premium on the cheapest to deliver uh, during March. What you can see is that during March, you know, if you were thinking that hedge funds are selling a bunch of these things and overwhelming dealers, we'd expect that the price of the cheapest to deliver should fall relatively. Instead, it actually rose, which is consistent with the general liquidity premium this earns. Um, and we can see that that happened across different futures contracts. And if we look at the figure on the right, this is sort of giving you a little bit of a window into how we do this. This is the yield curve fitting exercise we do to sort of determine that uh, cheapest to deliver premium. So the difference between the fitted yield based on other treasuries and the cheapest to deliver yield at, uh, at that particular point in time is what our premium measure is. What we can see is that that premium that the cheapest deliver was earning was fairly unique to those cheapest deliver securities. You can maybe make a story that the second cheapest to deliver during this period in the two-year contract was similarly large in terms of a premium, but it's uh, mostly in those, the two-year, the five-year, and the 10-year cheapest to deliver. So all of this suggests that instead of being sort of overwhelmed by um, sales of the cheapest delivered by hedge funds, dealers were actually more willing to hold these cheapest to deliver treasuries during March than other comparable treasuries. Now, this makes some amount of sense in that, you know, just like the, um, we can sort of think of the on the run premium is coming from the fact that there's a lot of volume trading and on the run securities. We can think of the cheapest to deliver premium is coming from the fact that there's a lot of volume of trading in the cheapest to deliver. And during a time of you know, particular stress, if I'm a dealer, I want to take on the treasury that I can expect to resell most easily if something else goes wrong. Now, um, 
one reason we think that dealers may have been so willing to take these treasuries on, which then sort of shortcuts a potential uh, sort of margin spiral that could have otherwise occurred, was because of the extraordinary actions that the Fed took and their precise timing. So in particular, uh, the Fed intervened in two ways in treasury markets during this time, uh, both of which we think were important. So the first way is by intervening directly into the repo market. So what we're showing you here is the rates in different segments of that repo market. So we have the sponsored borrower rate, so think hedge funds, the sponsored lender rate, think money market funds, and an interdealer rate over here. Uh, the two black lines here denote the rates on the Fed's repo and reverse repo facilities. Um, down on this axis, we're showing the volumes in the repo and reverse repo facilities at the same time. Now, what we can see in these gray periods are, these gray windows are periods where uh, um, the amount of volume in those facilities, which are sort of auctioned off, actually pushed the rate up beyond its, its lower limit. So that suggests that essentially the Fed facilities had reached the amount that they were able to lend into the market on those days. And what we can see is on those particular days, the spread, I mean, first of all, the repo rates rose on all three of those during all three of those periods. But in addition to that, the spread between sponsored borrowers and the interdealer rate generally rose as well. And the largest of these increases was on March uh, 16th right before the Fed's facility actually came into effect in the uh, afternoon of that day. Um, so what the Fed did was remove, or rather raise the cap on the facility large enough that it wasn't binding for anyone. That occurred right here on the 16th. And following the removal of that cap, we can see that rates generally fell pretty precipitously across different segments of the repo market, which suggests that this was an effective move. Now, the second thing that the Fed did during this period was increase their purchases of treasuries, and in fact, specifically increase their purchases of cheapest to deliver treasuries, which are usually excluded from Fed purchases. Now, um, we don't think that these purchases had an immediate effect. If we look at the graph over here, the two um, treasury futures contracts that most of the trade is uh, concentrated in are the two-year and the five-year. And we can see that throughout March, purchases of the two-year and the five-year are actually very small. Now that's completely consistent with the idea that dealers really want to hold those treasuries at that point. They're gonna sell anything else to the Fed, but the cheapest to deliver that they find more valuable for. But after April 1st, we can see that, these, that the purchases increased dramatically. Now this is after the period of the highest treasury market stress, things are actually coming down at that point. But what we think happened, what we think was important here was the, the signal by the Fed that they were included in cheapest to delivers in the purchases at all. It gives you some assurance as a dealer to know that, you know, I am able to offload this treasury onto the Fed if I can't find another seller at a later date. So we think both of these um, interventions were important. It's a little bit difficult to disentangle the effects of the two and talk about which one was more important. Uh, but in general, what they did was lower the cost to dealers of, of carrying treasuries by um, increasing the amount of, of repo financing available. And at the same time, take some of those treasuries off of dealers' balance sheets. Um, so they may have been in fact complementary. All right, so I think I'm about out of time. I'm just gonna conclude real quick. So, you know, in the wake of the extreme movements we saw in treasury markets in March of 2020, there's been a lot of focus by us, by others on hedge funds holdings of treasuries. What we're showing you in this paper is that a sizable amount of those holdings can be associated with an arbitrage trade known as the cash futures basis trade, uh, which increased in part because it seems to have become more profitable in recent years. Uh, what our paper does is sort of tie that together with the broader issues of, of treasury market structure um, and shows that hedge funds through this trade are acting as warehouses for treasuries. So that sort of gives, again, this comes back to a welfare question, right? Um, how valuable is that warehousing role relative to the risks that these hedge funds is undertaking is sort of an important thing for uh, people interested in this topic to disentangle. Now, another thing that this model emphasizes, the cost side of this is, of course, that uh, there's a risk that this trade could amplify 
dashes for cash in the treasury market. And while this trading seems to have increased quite, decreased, decreased quite a bit following March, um, we think this risk is still present and it's still important to think about how to, um, how to deal with and what the consequences are of larger hedge fund holdings of treasuries generally. That's it. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. I know I was probably moving a little bit fast near the end. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, so we're now kind of in like the open Q&A session. So if there's like questions going all the way up, you can just kind of ask. Um, and if there's like a landslide of questions, we can uh, go past uh, go past the top of the hour because Jay says you'll stick around. So um, I'm, I know, to see I'm at it. Go for it, Albert. No, this was a brilliant. Uh... Uh, presentation. It's, uh, you've got so much detail. Um, um, I was wondering um, what what would you you did talk specifically about you know reg regulation and what could be improved um, uh, or uh, and I'm, I'm I, I realize that we're on air and you are with the OFR so what can I expect? But um, uh, I nevertheless since it's an academic seminar I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, and yeah. what you know for me, what sounds like a bit tricky is the is the um, Fed assistance to the on the CTD. They started buying that because that, if I understood your, your your story correctly, you sort of have an outlet as a dealer, even if the hedge funds you know throw yeah. it back at you in the futures markets. So so that's very natural. So it sounds <laughs> like where the assistance was needed in the peripheral security, so non CTD, and and to yeah. To, to come in there sounds like that's not a good idea. I don't see the complete rationale there. For, for why purchase the cheapest to deliver as opposed yes. to any yes. other. Specifically, but of course, yeah. also the broader question of what I yeah. have to think about regulation. So um, first of all, I, do, I, I think that that's probably, there's probably an effect, let's say a direct effect of buying treasuries generally on this, on this trade. Exactly as you're saying, you're relaxing the dealer balance sheet costs more generally, right? Um, and so, you know, why, what's the sort of marginal effect of purchasing the cheapest to deliver on top of that? I think, I mean, you're right that you could hold the treasury for an additional, let's say at that time, it was three months to the next delivery date and offload it at that point. I think this is providing dealers within, during normal times, this wouldn't matter, right? Three months, nobody cares. Uh, during a period where dealers are already dealing with a dash for cash of unclear duration, it's, during the time nobody knew how bad this was going to be or how much, you know, how quickly it was going to resolve. I think that having that outlet might be important, but you're right that this is an important part of sort of disentangling which interventions mattered during that period. The most we can say with the data we have right now, although this is a topic that we're also interested in looking at more, is that generally the interventions which occurred all around the same time seem to have been successful. We can't really, you know, I'm sorry to give a very dissatisfying answer to this, but we can't really disentangle, especially what the effect of the option to sell to the the cheapest to deliver it to the Fed was versus the option to sell any other treasury uh, because they announced it at the same time as the broader treasury purchases. Understood. Thanks a lot. Yeah. What, could, I, could I add one, one thing that yeah. I think is completely uncontroversial? Uh, I, there's also probably some recognition that needs to be given that ex post we can sort of figure these things out, but in real time, you know, it wasn't so clear. And so knowing the connection that the cheapest to deliver serves between the futures market and the cash market, if you're buying everything else, it's not clear that it was harmful to add that into the basket as well when we didn't really have a handle on the problem the way we have a handle on it now. Yeah, yeah, I think I think my co-author has given a better answer that like there was, it was a scary time, right? <laughs> so like, <laughs> Taking out multiple bazookas may have been a, a, a good way to, to solve it, uh, even if, you know, individual ones, we don't know how much effect it had. Sorry, that's uh, 
I think that was a satisfying answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I think Chester's next up on the queue. Do you want to go ahead, Chester? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I thought it was a very interesting paper. So uh, one of the kinds of multiplicity. So you referred to certain, some multiplicities just now, and in a different, in a different, in a different way, there were there was there was a dash for cash during this during the March 2020 domain in many different ways. Mm -hmm. do you, do you, is there some way to link link these up? Um, and get at the comparison um, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, was there sort of arbitrage w across the dashes for mm -hmm. cash? And so we should just adjust the shadow. So we had sort of a different shadow price for cash or is there some way to make the linkage between, we've heard, because, yeah. you know, over, over the last year and a half, we, you know, the theme of dash for cash has emerged in a variety of, of studies. And I, I wonder whether they can be put together and whether there's sort of like a shadow price for cash that prevailed in that in that period of, of time. Yeah, I so I focused a lot on the, the treasury market relative to the dash for cash. Uh, it's definitely true, right? That across papers, we're seeing the this, this same result, sometimes by the same agents, right? And I think that may be one way to tie them together is that, um, you know, the. The selling by mutual funds of treasuries, for instance, it wasn't just, you know, exogenous out of out of nowhere. They were selling because someone else was redeeming mutual fund shares. So I think there's an, a macro push in the background where, like, because of COVID uncertainty, I want to have a higher cash buffer. That behavior is actually also what we think was going on with foreign official accounts was that they wanted a cash buffer for different reasons for government expenditure for, you know, foreign exchange rate uh, operations. Um, I think if there is a common theme, it is exactly that that shadow price for cash went up and that the Treasury market was particularly affected because of the fact that it is sort of in some kind of hierarchical model, you sell the most liquid thing first when you need cash immediately, right? Um, that's that's my lame attempt to tie those all the stories together. I don't know if it's completely satisfying, but I think it's as close as I'm likely to get here. <laughs> well, well, I think that's an interesting response. Um, you know, I, I think to the extent that w one can kind of pull together um, um, the different elements of the, of of the dash for cash, or, or yeah. kind of makes sense across across different markets. I think that would be that could that could be a, a that could be a significant contribution. Um, yeah, because yeah. Uh, you know obvi obviously you know we, you know people you, you know we don't under we don't understand so much about uh, about that, but it's it's clear you know that during this period of time um, the dash for cash was a was a fundamental was a fundamental friction. Yeah, I mean I think. It I'm going to make sure I'm being somewhat mindful of that. I think that that is like a super interesting project, like, and super important. Uh, it's going to be hard, right? I mean, in this case, we had to stitch together a bunch of data sets to get the picture that we could of this trade. And we had significant advantages in that the trade is fairly stylized. There's a direct link to a particular security. More generally, right, it's going to be real hard to form those kinds of pictures, right? <laughs> um, but I think it's an important thing to, to, to work on. And I guess maybe I should plug, you know, uh, the OFR's annual report as a place that, that sort of tries to take a broad perspective on this kind of stuff. I don't know, Danny, if you wanna do something similar. No, I, I would just say that Annette Vissing Jorgensen has a paper that sort of does yeah. the opposite, which is who all was selling treasuries? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's fix the asset class, look across the participants. The question about sort of, you know, the the margins on on demand for cash. Yeah, I think I think Jay got it right. That's important and tricky. Thank thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, hey Jay, you may want to turn off your uh, turn off screen share so we can have like the collaborative. Oh, yeah. Let me do that. Uh, so if you want to consider that. I just I keep um, doing it because I'm risk averse. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's fine. It's a, it's a good thing to be risk averse about. Um, I think next up on the queue is Andreas. Is that Utman? 
Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks. Um, one one yes. question about the uh, thank you <laughs> about the the motivation or the original motivation for this basis trade. I mean, you, you seem to suggest that it's mostly warehousing of U.S. Treasury risk uh, that's at work here. I was wondering to what extent your third alternative, uh, the repo market, being just cheaper because of say large QEs by the Fed were, were a reason. Yeah. Um, have you looked at three months term repos, for example, to 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 get at this channel? And could you use potentially tapering? Question tapering by the Fed as you know because you know to see whether that kind of like changes the basis uh when the, when the Fed tapers because I mean uh, you know these money yeah. market funds had a lot of cash to push into the market so so I'm gonna I'm gonna by in answering that I'm gonna diverge for a second into sort of how we came to this we actually started looking at this because we were interested in the repo market right we were interested specifically in the fact that you know uh, repo rates have been rising relative to say uncollateralized uncollateralized loans, right? And so this, you know, one way to describe the basis trade is arbitrage between treasury cash and futures markets. But you know, another equivalent way is to describe it as arbitrage of the repo rate. The repo is agreement to you know purchase a security today, sell it at a later date. Purchase price is what you pay for the cash security. The later date selling is the is the futures price. And so this is a way to reconstruct that. And the reason that I am mentioning all of this is because like during the period that we're looking at, when we look at overnight rates, um, we see them actually rise at least relative to the Fed, uh, Fed funds target range, right? So around 2018, um, treasury repo rates actually come up, um, which suggests that if anything, it might be getting more costly. Now, I haven't looked at term repo rates, which you're right, would be another important component of this. I, there are a couple of reasons I haven't done that so much. One is that, that parts of that market are relatively illiquid. So I, I get a little suspicious of term rates that are reported. But another reason is that we, we find that most of the borrowing here seems to be overnight, not term. Right, so that emphasizes rollover risk. But even then, you're right that looking at that term rate might give us a sense of how large that rollover risk is. So, yeah, yeah especially if there's flush cash in the system. I mean, you wouldn't want to lock yeah. it in for three. You would want to do it overnight. You know, to have liquid, you yeah. know, liquidity available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. That's completely right. Um, but but yeah, the the fact that the repo rate rose at least for general collateral transactions suggests to me that. Uh, it was getting more costly, but again, like that doesn't necessarily speak to what's going on with the repo rate for hedge funds specifically. And unfortunately, there's just there's no data, right? Like, and and I mean that like no one, it doesn't exist. It's not that we don't have it. Like, no one collects it. Like, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, should I be looking at the, the messages? I have not been. No, I, I think Davide had his hand up, but. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, no, just a, a quick question was, did you consider looking at what happened on uh, like March 31st when the Fed sort of uh, didn't include did the, treasuries as part of the SLR because that could go to Albert's question. Is it a yeah. CTD sort of general treasury yeah. or is it any general treasury, right? So by relaxing an SLR, the cost of any treasury goes down. Uh, and then you can say if the, I don't know, the effectiveness or the frequency of CTD versus no CTD bonds change around the state. So we can, that's, that's a good question. So, you know, we show the spread for that entire period but we don't look specifically at the 31st. Did we do this at some point, Danny, and I'm forgetting about it? No, but, but one thing I will say about the, the SLR is, is this whole other animal. And for, for anybody on the, on the call that is sort of doesn't know that the, the, there's a, a regulatory minimum called the supplementary leverage ratio, which uh, sort of describes how much maximum leverage you can take uh, as, a, as a bank. And it includes treasuries and repos in the denominator without any sort of risk correction. So it's not like 
they're super yep. safe and so you get the benefit of it. It's really sort of a gross notional kind of, kind of thing. Uh, the evidence that I have seen around the SLR is that any sort of decent empirical thing you might try and do doesn't give you any action on sort of how close to binding you might have been to the SLR and this sort of stuff. Now, the reason that's unsatis unsatisfactory is how close you are to the SLRs and dodges, right? Mm -hmm. So having a bigger buffer might just mean that you have greater volatility in the underlying components of leverage and therefore you're not actually safer or, or something. But uh, I think the, the views that I have seen from the policy folks that you know, inside and outside the regulatory community that study this is that the SLR was really sort of tertiary to, to all of this, that it, it wasn't mattering uh, much, but I think it's an unsolved question. Yeah. I think people still find that unsatisfying, um, but nobody's been able to find any sort of evidence in support of SLR mattering yet. I, I, I think that there's one thing. Yeah. So first of all, the SLR is a thing that you might think would fall under things that would make it more costly for other people to hold treasuries, right? So that that's definitely uh, a, a thing we can say. Um, the other thing that I'll say though, is that I think that part of the, there's sort of two schools on whether the SLR mattered and or whether the treasury purchases and repo operations mattered. So that's like 16th versus 31st. Um, and I think, a lot of it comes down to whether you care about when the when the bid ask spreads, for instance, start to to come back together, or when they actually came back together, right? Um, and I think we take the view of like we care about when it comes down from the peak, and other people look at when it comes closer together. So that's what leads us to be more focused on the 16th, and other people to be more focused on the 31st. I don't have any expectation that sort of uh, I, I and when I started at working in this area, I had the expectation that the treasury market was liquid and things move instantaneously. And now I have more of uh, I'm more cynical about that. And so that's why I go for the peak instead of the, the close of, of the spreads. OK, sorry, I wigged out there for a second. My my client is. Linux is free if you don't value your time or anybody else's time. Um, so uh, I don't, oh, I see a hand from Andreas. I don't know if that's a, the same hand. Yeah. No, no, so that's a new one. Go for it. Um, one question on the warehousing of risks. So, so in a way, kind of what you're saying is uh, hedge funds are storing these treasuries. Uh, does the basis go up around times of issuances of treasuries, say kind of um, because, so I mean, that would be in a way a strong indication that, you know, there is a, you know, this supply has to be sucked up and they basically then, you know, enter the futures market in order to at least have a guarantee three months hence uh, yep. of, of getting rid of it. So we, we looked at this, we didn't find, we should do, we'll look at it again, because you're completely right that that is an important event that you would think might have an effect here. I think the last time we did this, we didn't find much of an effect. Uh, Danny, we definitely did this one, but I don't. It's been like a year and a half since. Yeah, and it's a little bit it, it's a little bit tricky yeah. because because in this particular like most recent event, they line up very nicely, right? I mean, you had this huge issuance of treasuries, yeah. you know, it, it's starting in late 2017, and then the basis widens in 2018, and the hedge funds come in. Right. So, but, but, you know, whether or not we have enough time series variation uh, in issuance relative to however you might measure bank capacity to, or dealer capacity to sort of absorb treasuries, I, I'm not sure we've just done a, done a good, a good enough job. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the question is specific, right. To, to the actual like settlement of the, the auction yeah the day you know the it's yeah. being issued you know you know that you know yeah. so that was my thing is it really a daily frequency mm -hmm. so you you yeah i agree that you might think that that would be a day that would have an effect one thing that i will note that may kind of mean that it doesn't is that very there are two cases that happen so in in recent times the cheapest to deliver has very rarely been so if what you care about is specifically the price of the cheapest to deliver, it's not clear that it would be affected by a, a new issuance, except 
and here's where it gets even tougher. In earlier periods, um, for the two-year contract specifically, I think, um, when it was more frequently the case that the on-the-run treasury was the cheapest to deliver, and you see this like jump up, right, on that date because we, in the implied repo rate, because it, you know the treasury that they everyone anticipated was going to be cheapest to deliver is actually auctioned and cannot be traded. Um, so that that's another thing that sort of compounds the analysis and makes it a little different or difficult. Um, I but I agree it's a it's a place of focus and it's something that we could look into in more depth. I mean, actually, I think that when we did this regression, it, it we wanted it desperately to work and it didn't. I should go back, even if it doesn't work. It's, it's worth sort of disclosing that I think because you're right that it seems like a logical thing and something we have to grapple with. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, sorry I let us roll over through the top of the hour, but we're in the formally done part, so um, <laughs> I don't see any further questions. If anybody's got one, they want to toss on the pile. Um, but as for right now, I think we can probably safely conclude. Um, so everyone, thank you guys for uh, hanging out here with us and uh, watching Jay's wonderful presentation. Um, please give Jay a round of applause or not at all if you have children who are asleep. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone. Yeah, it was all right. a lot of fun. Good, it was good to have you, Jay. <laughs>